Hi everyone. This video is a book review about a book that I discovered when I was watching somebody's YouTube channel. And the title of this book is Anoint with Oil. And it was written by Rebecca Park. I don't know if it's Totilo or Totillo or Totolo, but that is the author, Rebecca Park Totilo. Now, the reason I, or how I ended up on Rebecca's channel is because I had recently reviewed, a couple of months ago, a book called Healing Oils of the Bible, and it was written by David Stewart, PhD. I thought it was a very informative and interesting in-depth book. So I decided to do more research about essential oils and herbs of biblical times. And that is how I came across Rebecca's YouTube channel. So I watched a series of her videos and I felt that she was very knowledgeable about what she was talking about. She had done a lot of research. She had even traveled to the Holy Land to gather more information and learn about oils. And I thought, hey, why not support a, another author and buy her book? So when I bought her book, I was so surprised when it came with all of this information in the package. Now, she has an essential or aromatherapy program um, do her her institute, Aroma Hut Institute. And if you buy the book, it talks about her program. You also get <clears throat> a sheet which lists the prices of the certification. And you also get a sheet that has a list of the prices of her essential oils. I don't know how, like, how to buy her essential oils. I don't know if you buy them when you you enter the program or if they're part of the program, but I thought that was pretty cool. <sighs> but anyway, I gravitated towards this book because even though I'm not religious at all, I grew up in the Christian church. So anytime I read things related to the Bible or of a biblical nature, it's because it reminds me of my childhood. I went to a church school. Um, I was in church like, I don't even know, five, six days a week. It was basically my whole life in the Bible as well. So I like reading books about it because I feel it adds more to what my education did not give me. I also have a very deep interest in herbs. I love reading about herbs. I'm not very knowledgeable when it comes to aromatherapy and essential oils. So that's why I've increased my reading materials surrounding or about aromatherapy and essential oils. And I think this book did a very, very good job talking about the herbs and how they were used as essential oils in terms of the holy anointing oil of the temple. So before I get into my book review, let me tell you a little bit about the author. Now this is her. She still kind of looks like that. I don't know how long ago this book was published. It was published in 2014, but she still basically looks the same. And this may be an old bio, but I'm going to read it anyway. It says, Rebecca Park Totilo is a sought-after international speaker that teaches about the biblical essential oils from a Hebrew perspective and how they can be used today to restore divine health. She offers professional aromatherapy certifications courses online. As a prolific award-winning writer of both inspirational and instructional books, she has authored over 41 books with some titles selling over 1 million copies. Rebecca lives in Florida with her husband and four children. And in the back of the book, she has some other books that she's written and I'm definitely buying um, maybe all of them. <laughs> <laughs> like there's one about organic beauty there's one called heal with oil how to use the essential oils of ancient scripture she has one about therapeutic blending and another about just healing with essential oils so i just thought that was really really cool 
I think in the past she had a show. I don't know if she still has a show, but it was called Rebecca at the Well. And it was a blend of like focusing on the healing essential oils of the Bible as well as the biblical stories. And the way that she ran the show is basically how she wrote this book. It was like the perfect balance of biblical history and also aromatherapy. I didn't feel like I was getting more of one than the other. It was just this perfect balance, kind of like the healing oils of the Bible book. When I read this book, it was only 177 pages, but I've been getting very surprised by these books that are under 200 pages because they are really full of information. When I was reading, you could tell that not only did she have a passion for um, <clears throat> biblical history, but she also did a lot of research into the science of essential oils. I learned so much and had so many questions that I um, had come up with for myself when I was reading the healing oils of the Bible and those questions were answered in this book. So I'm going to start off with <clears throat> the introduction. I'm going to share with you some of the things that really stood out to me in this book, things that I had never known before. I was just like, whoa. I actually said that a couple of times when I was reading. I was like, whoa, that's amazing. So she starts off with the introduction, and she mentions that like in the past, the um, those who made the ointments and the oils, they were listed as, you know, magic potions. And a lot of the people were persecuted. They were burned at the stake, even though they were, you know, just creating oils and different healing salves. But, you know, in a certain time period, they were just burning people for anything, particularly women. And she also brings up <clears throat> that... After the death of the apostles, the Christian church's practice of anointing with oil and burning incense was reserved as a devotional act during religious services only. It should be no surprise then that this ancient art has not been widely practiced for centuries and has lost much of its richness. And I agree with her because as I grew up in the church, no matter which church I went to, you barely saw anybody doing anything with anointing, especially with oils. Um, the only time, the only time I've ever seen somebody in church incorporating anointing oil was when I went to this Nigerian church and they had, they had a, a cup of the oil because the pastor really firmly believed in um, instantaneous healing and prosperity version of Christianity. So he would anoint his, um, his congregation and they would line up and get anointed with the oil. The other time that I saw somebody being anointed with oil, and I, oh wait, no, maybe three times. Catholic church, that's one. But the other one that was not the Catholic Church was a divine science church. And the woman, one of the teachers there that anointed the congregation, she used to have her own church, which was also like a divine science church before she found that. And she incorporated anointing oils and healing into that. So you don't really see that much depending on which church you go to in the church they might like make an excuse like oh you can just use any oil it really doesn't matter it's, it's only for a special occasion but this author puts all of them to shame so she says were you taught by church leaders that the practice of anointing with oil seized during the old testament times with the prophets and kings or that anointing with oil is simply symbolic and has no special power or significance today. Some church denominations believe that the practice of anointing and miracles ceased after the death of the apostles of the New Testament. Could it 
B, they are simply missing an important element of how these miracles were performed and took place. And I really, I truly, firmly believe that. I mentioned, I think I mentioned with that book and another book in the Healing Oils of the Bible book and also another book about healing that these churches, these leaders of the churches, I feel they lack faith. I feel personally that the reason they don't incorporate the essential or, or the anointing oil into there is I firmly believe they might not believe in the power of the anointing oil, that, that it is a tool that can be used for instantaneous healing. They also don't have enough enough faith in allowing themselves to be a vessel for healing to flow through. So they'll just make excuses and be like, oh, you know, um, I guess it's just God's will. You can't just push everything on God's will. I'm sorry, you just can't. <clears throat> so chapter one, she talks about the importance or the purpose of anointing with oil. And the primary purpose, she says, of anointing a priest or object used in the tabernacle or temple was to make them Kodesh. I think that's how it's pronounced, Kodesh. Q-O-D-E-S-H, which is set apart, most holy as described in Exodus 30, 29. It says, while the holy anointing oil was originally used exclusively for priests and the articles used in the temple Later, it extended to include prophets and kings. I really like that when she references, when she mentions something in her book, she'll reference the scripture. You can just go to it. Some people just write in a way where they're like, oh, it's this, it's that. And they'll just say it as like, because I'm, I believe in this. So of course you believe in it too. So I don't need to reference anything. But she wrote this book in a very scholarly way, but also in a personal way. And she lists um, certain parts of the Torah where there were certain restrictions outlined for the use of the oil. There was, it's forbidden to use the holy anointing oil on an outsider, Exodus 30, 33. It is not to be used on the body of any common person. That's Exodus 30, 32a. And Israelites were forbidden to duplicate any like it, nor were they allowed to use a specific formula outlined in scripture for personal use. Exodus 30, 32b. Now she mentions or goes into detail about these reasons later on in the book. She also does a really good job of refer referencing other um, books about herbalism and essential oils and the Bible so that you, the reader, can go even more in depth to learning about how to use these things. Now, there was one chapter, the what is anointing. Wait, no, 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 no. Hold up. I went too fast. I went too fast. It was anointing in Old Testament times. I just was reading chapter two. So anointing in Old Testament times. What stood out with this chapter in particular was she answered my question of how the essential oils or the holy anointing oil could actually alter your DNA. I had read somewhere before, I don't think it was in Healing Oils of the Bible, but it was somewhere else where they were talking about like, you had a lineage of priests. And I always wonder, like, how do they know which which one is, you know, is it like a priest? Like, how do they determine that? How do they find it out? Well, answered my question in the first chapter. She said, during the Mosaic period, a compilation of specific oils were designated by Yahweh for making the holy anointing oil in order to sanctify the Hebraic genealogy known as the Kohanim priests, so C-O-H-A-N-I-M, priests, and they had a ritual anointing, and this anointing registered in the DNA of their cells, because you know with essential oils, they can go break the blood-brain barrier, they can, you know, cross it, 
So once you get past that barrier, you can have a healing effect on your body, a powerful effect on your emotions and your soul. You can heal somebody of emotional trauma or assist in the healing of somebody with emotional trauma through the use of essential oil, especially if you place them on the right um, pressure points. Another thing, mentioning pressure points, I like how she incorporated Ayurveda and traditional Chinese medicine into this book. I was actually very surprised. Um, a lot of books, especially if it's like religious Christian books or Jewish books, they never really mention other modes of modalities of medicine, I guess, because they don't want to be, um, what do you call it? Not hypocrisy like like a heretic or something. <sighs> but anyway, she says, today's science is discovering essential oils ability to cross the blood brain barrier and change the molecular structure of a man. In an article entitled Lost Tribes of Israel, Nova Online reported on the existence of a distinctive Y chromosome in the DNA of Aaron's descendants. Now listen to this. So they did this study among the Kohenim priests all over the world, and 50% of the Kohenim in both Sephardic and Ashkenazic populations have an unusual set of genetic markers on their Y chromosome. What is equally striking is that this genetic signature of the Kohenim, Kohenim is rarely found outside the Jewish populations. Could it be or could it have been the essential oils used in the holy anointing oil that over the course of time altered the DNA of those members of the tribes of Levi? I'm like, whoa, that is crazy. That is so crazy. But, I mean, I'm not surprised, but it still, like, blows my mind. Kind of does. Because now they really are set apart. They are genetically set apart due to, use it, the, due to the usage of the holy anointing oil. Anyway, <clears throat> so as I told you earlier, she mentioned that in the Torah, there were some restrictions about who could and who could not use the anointing oil or who performs the anointing. So I read this earlier today where you could and could not put the anointing oil. You could put it on your head. Um, but, well, the right person putting it on your head. But maybe I'm getting too ahead of myself. Let me, let me slow down. Okay. Okay. There is a chapter called, Who Was Anointed in the Bible? And the anointing happened to signify God's blessing or a call on that person's life. A person or an object was anointed for a special purpose, whether it be a king, a prophet, or an instrument used in the sanctuary. As a public act with witnesses gathered, an anointing makes a clear distinction of the one called for a specific purpose. I remember my mother telling me a couple of times that I was anointed as a baby. We went to this evangelical church uh, no, was it? Yeah, it was called Evangelical. I, I, don't, I don't know what it was called, but that was my childhood church. And I was anointed in front of the whole congregation. The pastor said like a very long prayer, like she will go off and she will do great things and something, 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 something. And everybody's like, wow, that's an amazing prayer or something. So that's the only time I in my life have known myself to have been anointed by somebody. But anointing was not something that was just passive. It wasn't something like, okay, they're anointed, the end. No, it was, it was very, very sacred, which was why only specific people were used, uh, were anointed, and only why specific parts of your body were anointed. She mentioned earlier that you had to use it in an appropriate way. You couldn't put it on let's say a man's flesh and in this case a man's flesh 
would basically be like genitalia. Like you couldn't use them on like the genitalia of a person because I feel maybe that would have made the oil profane. You couldn't use it on a stranger, like an outsider. It was only for those who was selected for it. It says, listed below are examples of those anointed in scriptures. There was priests to carry out the duties of worship and sacrifice, prophets to proclaim God's word, kings to rule and lead, the sick for restoration, guests in hospitality, enjoyment and pleasure, objects which were set apart for holy service, the deceased or for burial for preparing the body, and then the people of God, the joy oils of joy and gladness. And she goes into detail about like each and every group listing references of scriptures and um, why this person or this type of person in particular was anointed. And just reading this also confirmed to me my point like these modern day pastors, even though I don't go to church anymore, I don't go, I'm not religious, but I do know that these modern day pastors, most of them, they don't take their calling seriously. They don't take the anointing oil seriously. They just doing it in like this very lukewarm way. I would rather you be hot or I would rather you be cold but don't be lukewarm. Imagine the miracles that could happen if they truly dived into creating the anointing oil, preparing themselves spiritually, physically, mentally to start a revival in their congregation. Just imagine how many healings would occur. That is why you read about the first century Christians going out and healing, but you don't read about these modern Christians going about and healing. That's why I say, even though I had grown up in the Christian church, I said this before, I've never really met that many Christians. I've never really met that many true people that practice Judaism. I've never come across them because I'm seeing it by their actions. They're not doing what they were called to do. In the Bible, Jesus had claimed to said to them, go out, heal the sick, do this, do that, preach the gospel, all of that. Okay, you're going out preaching the gospel, okay. Or so you think you are, or so you say you are, because I can't see you. But one thing you're not doing, nobody's coming to you to be healed of their sicknesses, like the people of the biblical times. For example, wherever Jesus went, whether he existed or not, wherever he went, people knew they could go to him and be healed. People will push through crowds just to touch the hem of his garment. Nobody's coming through a crowd to grab a Christian and expecting to be healed. In fact, church is the last place they go if they need anything. Church is not a place or Christians are not the type of people that people associate with just divine healing. And that should change and I feel that incorporating the anointing oil will really start a revolution in that religious system. Well, that's just me personally. So <clears throat> it says for the anointing for the priests it says there are over 30 incidents of priests being anointed in the Bible. And Aaron was anointed. Aaron was Moses' brother. He was anointed as Israel's high priest with the anointing oil. And it says in Exodus 40, 13, And thou shalt put upon Aaron the holy garments and anoint him and sanctify him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Moses is instructed to take the anointing oil and pour it over his head, unlike what many pastors and churches do today by placing a dab of oil on the finger. They're like, oh, here you go, or making the cross like, here you go, here's this. No, you pour it over their head. It covered and trailed down the, his garment. They had 
a bowl or, or a cup or whatever they did, and they poured it on his head till it went all over his body. His whole body was anointed. They did not do lukewarm. They did hot. No, not hot oil, but like they were either cold or they were hot, but they were not lukewarm in how they operated in anointing. It says precious ointment on the head that ran down the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garment. It says, interestingly, David compares harmonious unity and brotherhood to the fragrant anointing oil that ran down the head of Aaron over his beard. And it was from Psalm 133, one through two. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. Prophets were anointed so that they could go out and declare the works of God. And I thought that was pretty neat because some people, I met a lot of people claim they were prophets and I'm just like, no. No. People innately know what is the real, who or what is the real deal. People innately know that. They know. They can see through fakery from a mile away. And if you are a prophet, according to the system, and you are not anointed, and you're just going around preaching and everything, you're really not going to get anything done. Like in the Bible, you had Elijah and Elisha. Elijah, everybody knew he was a prophet. They could see it from a mile away. They knew that he could heal them. They knew that he could perform miracles for them because he was a true representative of Yahweh. Nobody had to question whether he was or not. They just knew. They could see it with their eyes. As modern day Christians, which I'm not a Christian, but I feel modern day Christians could do a better job of being better representatives of God. I could, they could just go out with a fire to change the world and bring love into the world instead of being fearful and thinking that they do not have the capacity to be anointed, that they are not special and cannot be chosen. I feel like God would choose you if you had the desire to follow God in that capacity. Some people aren't ready to go full throttle. They aren't. They're just going to be, you know, lukewarm. That's why they're not selected as a prophet. That's why they're not selected to go and be the, the voice piece of God or the, the spokesperson of God in God's ways because they are being victims of, you know, cowardice and complacency. Kings were anointed. Who else? The sick. I thought that was pretty neat. Burial. Objects. As you know, you had like the, um, what was it? The I can't remember what it was called. It wasn't the mercy seat. I literally don't know what it was called. Hospitality. Hospitality. You are anointed to show hospitality. So in that story of Jesus being anointed on his feet, um, being anointed with the hairs of, I think it was might have been Mary or the woman with the alabaster jar, I believe the jar contained spikenard, which was a very expensive oil. And she anointed his feet with her hair and her tears and all of that. And it was part of that tradition after if you had a guest to, you know, wash their feet, anoint their head, kiss them, all of that. A common practice in the Middle East was to anoint one's head or feet as an act of hospitality Distant travelers and guests from afar would be refreshed with a foot washing for their sore, dusty feet, followed by an ointment rubbed in to soothe their sun-scorched skin. In Psalm 104, 
15 it reads, And wine that maketh glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face to shine, and bread which strengtheneth man's heart. So in this story, it was in Luke chapter 7, verses 44 through 46. Jesus was a dinner guest at a Pharisee's house. And the Pharisee was, you know, the Pharisee and the other guests were like, why, why is this woman over here crying and washing your, your feet with her, her tears and all of that? And Jesus said, And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. I thought that was very powerful statement for him to say because she wasn't a woman I'm assuming that was respected in her community um, that oil was very expensive I guess it was probably a year's worth of savings to get that oil and she used it on his on his feet this was a woman who gave her all. That is why she received his blessing. She just didn't give a little. She didn't give 1%. She gave 10,000%. And that was why she was acknowledged by Jesus. And Rebecca Park Totilo has a video on her YouTube channel that talks specifically about Spike Nard in this story. And it's really very good. Okay. One thing that also interested me was the thing about right-handed or left-handed, and she explained the differences between it. She said the right hand is very rich in symbolism. Um, in case of appointment, Jacob blessed Joseph's sons with his right hand. In addition, a person placed as the right-hand man of another high-ranking official shared in the honor with that office, and that person was recognized as possessing equal dignity and authority. So it just talks about, you know, the positivity of the right hand. And it says, <clears throat> hold on. In a predominantly right-hand world, the left hand is not favored, but it's still significant. Ecclesiastes 10.2 links a wise man's heart with his right hand and a fool's heart with his left. Now, this isn't to talk, you know, mess over left-handed people. It's just like, um, it's just different. No matter how odd and peculiar is the left hand regarded, there are stories of left-handed heroes such as Ehud, Ehud and the left-handed soldiers of Benjamin, David's Benjamite warriors in 1 Chronicles 12-2 were ambidextrous, so it's not like your actual, you know, right, left hand. But I feel, me personally, I feel the left hand, right hand thing might be just the brain. It might be like, they associate the, I think they associate the creative mind with the right and the analytical mind with the left, I guess. So maybe... Maybe the right hand represents like childlike faith and maybe the left hand represents the secular, the analytical world where you, you're in a state of um, thinking with rationality. So you're not open to the miracles that God can perform through you. I, I don't know. That's just me personally, my own interpretation. And she also mentions in this book there were specific ways. Okay, hold up. It says, why do we anoint? We anoint for impartation, some of consecration, blessings. I'm not going to read all of them, but for spiritual gifts, for emancipation, where... Um, Anointing with oil can break the yoke, a symbol of bondage and oppression. So sometimes you could 
anoint somebody to free them from the spiritual trauma and maybe the spiritual trauma and if you're not spiritual or anything could translate into emotional trauma and whatever was in the oils can release you from that emotional bondage because of the chemical reactions from the essential oils and your physical body perhaps it says worrisome burdens can be lifted and released when you anoint with oil and pray calling upon the lord to set you free she uses a lot of hebrew words in this book which i really like because i want to learn new words especially from that belief system she also has a chapter on the ingredients of the anointing oil. Now, in the book Healing Wheels of the Bible, he said any anointing oil was also an aromatic essential oil. And she basically says that too. Like it was just assumed that you had essential oils and your anointing oil. It wasn't just plain olive oil. It wasn't olive oil by itself. It was first pressed olive oil, the first oil, the first oil that came from the ripe, ripe olive, olives, I think, ripe olives, that was given to the temple. The Levite priests made it. It's also known as sweet oil. The rest went to, you know, cooking, lighting candles, all of that. But the first oil was the one that burned the brightest. It was more fragrant. The second press wasn't as fragrant. It wasn't as great as the first oil. So the best oil, which was the first press, went to the temple. It went to Yahweh. So some of the um, herbs, she says, the original formula for the holy anointing oil. The holy anointing oil described in Exodus 30, 22, through 25 was created from pure myrrh, sweet cinnamon, canna bosom, cassia, olive oil, and in many traditional Judaism, many in traditional Judaism, Judaism believe that the entire formula for the holy anointing oil is not published in the Torah. I can believe that. I can I can believe that because it's sacred, and if the priests, the Levite priests made it, of course they're not going to give their formula away. Um, Rebecca had mentioned in one of her videos something about we are a new priesthood. So perhaps we could make the oil, but we'd have to have the right spirit and all of those different things. I can't remember. You'd have to go to her channel and find that. But what is listed in the book of Exodus is simply a list of the building blocks, a foundation of ingredients for creating perfume. The recipe, in fact, was a guarded secret so that it would not fall into the wrong hands, and it contains over 20 ingredients. I can believe that. I really, I really can. It's just a building block. Um, let's see. I'm looking through it. So, ingredients of the holy anointing oil. She goes into brief detail of all of them. Myrrh. Myrrh, you know, that was used for, I want to say embalming or burials. Frankincense myrrh. She also goes by, it says, Myrrh was one of the first gum resin oils given as a gift to Yeshua as a young child by the Magi. In Matthew 2.11, it was also the last oil offered to him or to Yeshua at Golgotha when he was crucified. It's known as a pain reliever. So some of these ingredients, when she talks about the, the benefits, I'm like, this makes a lot of sense why this oil would heal. Like you have pain relievers, you have, it's, it's almost like it matches every aspect of your body that could be ill. Even if it's an emotional aspect of your body, there's an ingredient in there that helps with it. There's also cassia. Cassia grows in hot, wet, tropical climates, both wild and commercially. Its stems are cut down once the bark is mature. That was pretty cool. 
Then she has one called The Mysterious Fifth Ingredient. And I remember reading about this in this other book called Mystical Aromatherapy. And there were a bunch of people that were researching the holy anointing oil, like debating on like, no, this was not the ingredient. This was the ingredient. And, and she goes into some of the ingredients, like calamus, which is um, translate kana bosom as a chorus calamus and is also known as sweet flag. In Ayurvedic tradition, it is um, vacha is a sattvic herb which feeds and transmutes the sexual kundalini energy, the closest thing to a sex stimulant that nature has to offer. So maybe it does something to the nervous system. Then there's also Simbo Pogan, um, Indian lemongrass. There's cannabis, which I, I can see cannabis being in there because a lot of people use cannabis for pain relief and different things. So if that was an ingredient in there, I could see that happening. I could see that because like, it would help with the pain and different things. One of the last chapters is, should believers make the holy anointing oil and use it? Um, it is forbidden to make any other like it. I don't know if she really answered the question. I'd probably have to look again. But she explains like who it shouldn't be used on, which was, you know, a man's flesh, which is the genitalia. It shouldn't be poured upon a stranger. Um, it, ooh, what else? It's forbidden to make any other like it. So anything, any way where it's profane. It says this holy, this anointing oil is his and is holy forever. This is something that people need to go back and study to decide for themselves as to whether the holy anointing oil was set apart only for that purpose um, alone or whether or not it can be applied today with the understanding that the body of Christ is that temple. It says, and thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, This shall be an holy anointing oil unto me throughout your generations. I personally feel that if, let's say, I was going to make a holy anointing oil, I don't think I would make it right now. I feel like I would need a, a, at least a year of preparation. Like I would need to cleanse myself physically. I would need to be in a deep state of prayer, change a lot of my ways in order to just even start creating this anointing oil. I would have to be in a certain state of mind. And I think that is why mainly the priests made it because they had you know, the luxury of always being in this perpetual state of worship for Yahweh and all of these different things. They had the skills and the access to the raw materials to create this oil. They followed, the, they studied the Torah and all of those scriptures and they were already there. Most of them were already spiritually, emotionally, mentally prepared to create something like that. So if an average person was going to make it, I feel like they need to prepare before they make it. Or else perhaps it might become profane. I don't know. And it says, what oils did Yeshua anoint with? And she talks about almond, calamus root, and all of these different herbs. I'm like, wow, this is, this is really good. I also, also the last two chapters are very good. They had, she includes a healing ritual for guilt. And she also um, includes a chapter on creating a sacred space with anointing oil. So yeah, <sighs> I really think you should get this book because most of what I said really doesn't even scratch the surface of all of the information that this author has placed in this book. I am definitely going to use this as a reference for the future. I'm also definitely going to be buying more of her books. I think the next book I want to buy is called Heal With Oil, because that really caught my eye. I'm going to put a link in the description box 
and in the comments below so that you can purchase this book. I'll have a link to her website and a link to the, I think on Amazon where I got it. Um, I know if you get something on Amazon, they usually don't give the author all of their money. So that's why I'm including her website so she can get full pay. And if you're interested in joining her program, she also has, um, she also has the information about her essential oil aromatherapy program, which I thought is very cool. And I think it is a good program. It has, covers a lot of different things, 12 body systems and diseases. She has paperback books, course textbooks, DVDs, like everything you really need if you wanna venture into that field, especially if you wanted to focus incorporated into you know your ministry if you're a person that's religious that's of the christian faith i would try to you know incorporate that into whatever church you're going into talk to your leader or if you're a leader um just find a way to use this information that was given to you that you claim that you follow and start a new Revival in your church or in your congregation. Go around, heal the sick. So thank you for watching this video. I will be back next week with a different book review. I'm reading this book from the library about the internet and it is very, very interesting. So talk to you later, everyone. Bye-bye.